If you haven't seen my video on the Stags, I would suggest you watch that first. The NBA left the Chicago market in 1950 due to the Stags being foreclosed on and all of their players, including Bob Cousy, were sold off in the dispersal draft. After that, the NBA wouldn't return to Chicago until 1961, but unlike the Stags who found success before running into financial and ownership problems, this new attempt would be so bad, so bad that Chicago was even lucky to get a third chance at an NBA team. And this story begins with a man named David Traeger and his ownership group. The year of 1961 was the first year of expansion for the NBA, and the league decided to give Chicago another chance, something I'm sure St. Louis and San Diego would love the NFL to give. An insurance executive named David Traeger pulled together an ownership group and were awarded an NBA expansion team, prompted by Harlem Globetrotters owner Abe Saperstein having an American Basketball League team, not the same league from the 20s and 30s, around the same time called the Chicago Majors, who played at Chicago Stadium. Traeger's team, meanwhile, would be called the Chicago Packers. No, I did not stutter. That was the name Traeger went with. And ironically, they sported a color scheme of navy blue and orange just like the Bears. Traeger wanted a name to honor the Chicago Stockyards back when Chicago was the meat capital, even after all the lack of health and safety standards outlined in the jungle. The Packers initially played in the International Amphitheater, which was located next to the Union Stockyards on the south side, and was smaller than Chicago Stadium, seating 9,000 spectators compared to the over over 17,000 spectators at Chicago Stadium could hold at the time for basketball. As you can imagine, the amphitheater no longer stands as it was demolished in 1999. Saperstein got his team out first and thus got the bigger arena in the city. That being said, Saperstein's majors lasted less than two seasons before the ABL folded in the middle of the 1962-1963 season. In their inaugural 1961-1962 season, the Packers were an absolute flop. But why? Well, first and foremost, it's quite a lack of foresight to name a team after the bitter rival of one of the city's other teams. But as for the season itself, the Packers held the first overall pick, picking Walt Bellamy out of Indiana. It was a good pick as Bellamy won Rookie of the Year and was an All-Star from 1962 to 1965. And that's pretty impressive because the Packers that year were pitiful. Finishing in last place in the Western Division with the worst record that year at 18-62, and 62, along with a road record of 3-39. and 39. That's bad by any measure. Despite being coached by Laker legend Jim Pollard, who, ironically, was originally drafted by the Stags in his own playing career. Sure, it was the team's first year, but you have to come correct, especially if you're going to sell an entire market that this team can do big things, and that's for any market, big or small. Behind Behind the scenes, things were much worse as Traeger and his ownership group had shallow pockets and didn't have money to spend. Yeah, they could afford the initial entry fee of $250,000, which, adjusted for inflation, is just under $2.5 million in 2022, but not much else. On top of that, they were already looking into relocation at this time, specifically eyeing Baltimore. However, Baltimore's new arena, which would later open as the Baltimore Civic Center, wasn't expected to be completed until 1963. So in a the Packers were forced into playing one more season in Chicago before circumstances made it okay to move. Quite the scummy move indeed. Meanwhile, the team was almost bought by another investor group led by a man named Dick Klein who wanted to keep the Packers in Chicago and saw the potential of Chicago embracing basketball. However, Klein couldn't cough up the money to buy the team as Traeger was asking for $1.4 million, which adjusted for inflation is about $13.8 million in 2022. So after a disastrous first season in more ways than one, the Packers were renamed to the Chicago Zephyrs as a reference to Chicago's nickname, the Windy City. Huh. Meta. On top of that, the color scheme was changed, replacing orange with gold. Jim Pollard was fired and replaced with Bobby Leonard, who was also a player for the team at the same time. Basically, Jackie Moon from Semi-Pro minus owning the team. Jack McMahon actually started out as the Zephyrs head coach before being replaced by Bobby Leonard halfway through the season. In addition, the team moved to the Chicago Coliseum, another arena on the south side. The Chicago Coliseum was not only the third arena to bear the name, but 
also was the original home of the Chicago Blackhawks up until Chicago Stadium was built, rendering Chicago Coliseum obsolete. And yet despite this fact, it still kicked around throughout the Great Depression and was refurbished for the Zephyrs in 1962, increasing its seating capacity to 7,000. This arena would stay around until being partially demolished in 1982 with a rebuilding project in mind, but that fell through with a total demolition in the early 90s. Initially, I thought they moved into a smaller arena just so games would feel less empty, akin to tarping seats off today. Nope. It's because it was cheaper to play in the Chicago Coliseum than it was to play at the amphitheater. Quite the penny-pinching move. Besides, anyone who even cared a little knew that the writing was on the wall for the team. Once again, the team held the first overall pick in the NBA draft and selected Bill the Hill McGill out of Utah, a player known best for inventing the jump hook. But that wasn't the highlight that year. No, that belonged to rookie Terry Dishinger. Selected in the second round and eighth pick out of Purdue, Dishinger, much like Bellamy the previous year, won Rookie of the Year and even had an all-star appearance. They also selected future Hall of Fame coach Don Nelson in the third round, pick 17 out of Iowa. Nelson played in the lone season the team was known as the Zephyrs before getting cut and then picked up by the Lakers the next season. Of course, he'd ended up with the Celtics like Bob Cousy and racked up rings before taking up coaching. However, it didn't help as the Zephyrs, once again, finished last in the Western Division with a record of 25-55, and 3-23 and on the road this time, second worst that year a Above the Knicks. After two embarrassingly terrible seasons, the team had lost $400,000, over $3.8 million in 2022, as a result of sucking so much and nobody in the city caring as Chicago had yet to become the basketball city it currently is known as, Traeger moved the Zephyrs to Baltimore like he had planned. The team would exist as the Baltimore Bullets until 1973, when the team would move again, this time to Washington, D.C., where they are currently known as the Washington Wizards. So while the Packers slash Zephyrs franchise still exists today unlike the Stags who folded, this was a colossal flop. It's typical that expansion teams will lose money in their first handful of years, but it's as if Traeger and his ownership group either didn't account for a loss, or they underestimated how much money they would lose. But whatever the case, this city is lucky to even get the Bulls three years after the Zephyrs packed up. Expansion teams struggle in their first few years, but their job is to at least elicit a reaction and interest from the local area area. That way, when they do become good, the team has the support and fan base behind them. Sure, not everyone can be the St. Louis Blues or the Vegas Golden Knights where you're immediately good to make it to the finals right out of the gate, but you gotta give the fans something to cheer for with a name they can get behind. You would think having young, talented stars like Bellamy and Dishinger would help, but I guess not. I still cannot believe they chose the name to be Packers, without the foresight that perhaps the name would be unpopular. Frankly, in hindsight, they probably would have been better off being the Zephyrs from the very beginning rather than Traeger's intent to honor Chicago's meatpacking industry. They lasted two seasons that were basically two first seasons. The Chicago public in the fall and winter months would have rather gone to watch the Bears or Blackhawks excel rather than a wimpy, pathetic excuse of an expansion basketball team. Hell, not even airing on the popular and easily accessible W. GN TV and radio helped to gain popularity in the local area. Ironically, Dick Klein, after failing to buy the team, would get together another group of investors, which also included Lamar Hunt of all people, yes, that Lamar Hunt, and get a new team in Chicago. Klein would also pick a name to honor Chicago's meat packing industry, but went with a name more tasteful and only one syllable, like Cubs, Sox, Bears, and Hawks. That name would end up being the Bulls, who came into the NBA for the 1960s. 1966-1967 season. Sure, the Bulls in their inaugural season also posted a record below 500, but they still managed to make the playoffs and ironically were better than their predecessors that very same year, with the Bulls finishing 33-48 and 48 compared to the Bullets finishing 20-61. and 61. And yes, the Bullets would reach the finals in 1971 and even win one in 1978 before the Bulls did, but 6-0 and will always be better than 1-4. and four. I think it's fair to say that expansion teams a, do suffer to start their existence, and B, lose money because of said suffering. But Klein took that into account with the Bulls, unlike Traeger, who panicked and immediately looked into moving the team elsewhere. But hey, that's what it's like being an optimist versus a complete moron. Much like the Stags, the Packers slash Zephyrs weren't completely forgotten. In the mid-2000s, the Wizards donned Zephyrs throwbacks on several occasions 
as part of the NBA's Hardwood Classics program, and ironically even wore them against the Bulls once. In terms of importance, you'll probably know this bit of history if you're an ultra-diehard Wizards fan, or you're just a sports nerd like I am. I mean, even researching this, you'd be hard-pressed to find information on the matter, and trust me, this and the Stags were hard to research. With how short the team's history in Chicago was, I don't think anyone would blame you for not even knowing this bit of history. Like how the Yankees used to have the same name as one of their division rivals, Brewers starting their first year as the Seattle Pilots, or even the Chargers' first stint in L.A. Honestly, the miracle in the story is that it even happened in the first place. But much like the story of the Stags, you don't get the Chicago Bulls without the Chicago Packers. Anyways, make sure to leave a comment, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.